going into an environment that's completely unforgiving. The temperatures that we're seeing on the spacecraft are not being seen by any other spacecraft ever before. The scariest thing about the sun is the unknown. We see it every day, but we see it from 93 million miles away. This first perihelion we're going into, we have very minimal contact. All we can get is a tone. I'm going to be waiting on the edge of my seat for those beacon tones. The sun-facing side will be exposed in excess of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to go closer to the sun than any other spacecraft has gone before. We're not going to do that once. We're not going to do it twice. We're going to do that 24 times. And that is terrifying. We really don't know what we're going to find until we get there. In 1958, Gene Parker had an idea that the area around the sun would behave in a certain way. There are two really overarching mysteries that we have always wanted to study. Why is the corona hotter than the surface of the sun? Why is the solar wind continuously accelerated? We are now in what we call our encounter attitude. The TPS is pointed at the sun and we will not leave that attitude until we get back around the backside of the sun. So we keep the thermal shield between the spacecraft body and the sun. We have designed the spacecraft to be able to do the right thing no matter what it sees. You can't do Parker Solar Probe unless you're willing to build an autonomous spacecraft that can take care of itself. You can't build Parker Solar Probe unless you can build a shield that can withstand the thermal environment. 
You can't do Parker Solar Probe unless you can keep the power generation cool. And all these things contain some level of risk. The sun is a wideband radio source, so any spacecraft is either in front of the sun, behind the sun, or near the sun. You can't talk to it. Parker Solar Probe is designed to transmit four different beacon tones. Beacon tone A is a good tone. The fault management system is reporting that all systems are nominal. The other three tones mean that some type of fault has occurred on board. We will be mostly out of contact with the spacecraft through encounter, so the only thing we will have is those beacon tones. We will be all waiting for the call. APL, APL, I am Parker Solar Pro. I'm doing well and they have surprises for you. The fear and tension and stress is all going to be focused on those last few minutes. This truly is a mission of discovery. Everybody. <laughs> Scott Roberts here with Jerry Hobble, Tyler Bowman, and Heath Creekmore. And uh, we're uh, somehow still standing. I, I don't know how that is, but, uh, but uh, we are. And uh, we had a great start party uh, last night. Um, uh, if you didn't, uh, were not able to attend, you should at least watch the rerun of it. Um, uh, we had, uh, you know, great tutorial by uh, Gary Parker, uh, lots of uh, live images coming down. Um, uh, we had art, uh, poetry, you know, original poem about Saturn from uh, uh, Nadine Frosch, and um, uh, great, great talks to begin with. So it was, it was awesome, and um, we're all happy that uh, you took part in it, if you, if you took part in it, so... <laughs> Anyhow, um, our show today, uh, we're not going to go on really long because I think we're all ready to uh, uh, hit the, uh, maybe take a nap. I don't know. I was talking to Jerry a little bit earlier and he was ta talking to me about just yeah. how tired he was, you know. But uh, I'm ready to take a nap this afternoon. You do astronomy a lot, so this should be like no big deal for you, right? Yeah, it's no like no big deal staying up late. It's just staying up during the day when I have to work. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, anyhow, um, uh, it was uh, it was great. Um, let's see who we've got on with us uh, this afternoon. Um, we got Nicholas Rochia, Tim Myers, Book Davies is with us. Um, Lots of talk between both Davies and Nicholas. <laughs> um, who else? Chuck Lewis is with us. It's great to, you know, wasn't Chuck awesome uh, on the on the uh, Daily Show? And um, oh yeah, towards the end there it was great. He got into kind of the uh, the open panel uh, section of the Star Party, which was kind of at the end, and I think for a lot of people, really kind of their favorite part of the Star Party because it's open sharing and you know the the group kind of has gotten to know each other or reacquainted with each other. I think the other thing that's cool about the Star Party, uh, as we bring in people that haven't been on the show before, um, you know, uh, we're reintroducing old friends, uh, which is which is great. You know, so having Alain Maury on the show uh, was incredible. Um, I did meet him in 1986 when I was doing my. Halley's Comet um, star parties at, at uh, Palomar, Observ or Palomar Mountain. And uh, he retold the story of how I stopped him uh, and tried to keep him from going into the gate uh, to um, uh, go home. <laughs> and I did not know that he was a professional astronomer working on the National Geographic Sky Survey on the, uh, on the uh, Palomar Schmidt camera. So, uh, you know, he just looked like this kind of young guy that uh, was out driving around. And we would have, when I ran star parties up there, I had a 
kind of an unspoken agreement with the uh, superintendent, his name is Bob Thixton at that time, uh, that if I saw anybody kind of going into the gate area that I would, you know, tell them to, you know, not go there and, and uh, head on out. So, but uh, uh, anyways, that was the beginning of a, a, what has now been a very long friendship, you know, so it's, it's been, it's been great to know Alain. Alain is a comet discoverer himself, uh, asteroid discoverer. Uh, he's named comets after various people. Um, I took part in uh, one of his uh, uh, comet naming uh, ceremonies, which was really cool. You know, it was a party that uh, we had in Southern California. He flew up from Chile for it, so uh, it, was, uh, it was really a neat experience. Um, what else can I say about the Global Star Party? What was your take on it, Jerry? It was really good. What was that young man's name that was on there at the end talking about the telescopes he builds, the Dobbs? Oh, um, Zane. Zane Landers. Yeah, Zane Landers. He's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. I know. He was saying, well, you know, I built, I built this 10-inch telescope, and that didn't work out, so I scrapped that, or I gave that away, or I sold this. And How many scopes did the guy build? I mean, he's just a teenager, right? right? 10 or 10 or 15 scopes, I think, that he went over. 20 years old. So, um, yep. you know, and he didn't start building them until he was like 15 or something. So, you know, this, this guy's already got a number of telescopes under his belt. And he's not building easy-to-build telescopes. These are, uh, what he's building are very fast Newtonians. So these mirrors are like F3.5 or less, 3.3, you know. And it's pretty innovative pretty innovative uh features on the uh on the dob mount mounting also yeah and so i mean there were many things we talked about that didn't work out for him but the thing that was cool is that he wasn't afraid to try something and build up a whole system and then was not afraid to tear it apart and start all over again so and I that zane was very and loves looking at the sky. A lot of telescope makers, telescope builders, they just like making the instrument and then they move on to the next one. Yeah, so, he was very knowledgeable of the optics too. He knew a lot about what he was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was uh that was interesting and refreshing, you know. Being a young guy like that. And and he was he was uh talking about a friend of his who's also fairly also very into it so anyways i i think we're starting to see more and more a younger generation of astronomers um, um, you know especially uh, attracted towards astrophotography but uh zane looks like he, he's a visual uh guy you know with his dobs and all the rest of it so we got two guys right here with us what's that we got two guys right here with us that are young guys. That they are young, aren't they? That's right. They're dust. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're we're dinosaurs. So <laughs> anyhow, um, so let's uh, let's move on to uh, tech support, the open go to community, and um, uh, what's going on out there. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll put the focus on you. Here, Heath. Um, let's see. Here, I'll stay on here with you. Hello. <laughs> you and I were talking earlier, and we were just talking about uh, people uh, trying to pick a telescope, or you know, what, what you've been with us now for how long at this point? Four months? Five months? I think it's more like three. Three months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, fresh. <laughs> Seems like six months. Seems like six. <laughs> Twice as long as what. It would. Um, but uh, uh, and I, you know, I see you doing a good job. You know, you're you're really working with the customers that come into the store. Um, you know, you do a good job with follow up on the phone calls and stuff. But uh, as someone new to this, how how are you helping people kind of navigate? Uh, picking maybe their first telescope, okay, and then how do you work with people that are much more knowledgeable than you are, you know, because we have customers that have been into this for 50 years, you know, so you're never 
I'm never going to know everything that these guys know, you know, so. Um, okay, so for the be for the beginner, like I was, um, I try to start out with asking them what they're interested in. Um, what objects are they wanting to look at, you know, observe, or just like tell their friends about, and then we can go from there. Um, every telescope is a little different, so I'm, I'm trying to match that, what they want to see to to the telescope that they might need. Right. That's the easy part. Uh, for, for people that have been in the game for a long time, I, I have to ask a lot of questions. I, I'm just learning as it goes. I, I have to ask questions. That's how I get through that. I mean, I, I do too. I do too. I, I will. Uh, what's funny about this is that sometimes, I mean, you might expect to get stumped by somebody who's a really a uh, long time expert uh, at something. Um, but sometimes I get stumped by a, a, you know, a rank beginner. They are, they're brand new to it and they ask this great question and I just have to look at them and go, you know what? I don't know that answer, but I'm gonna find out what it is, you know. Yeah, so they, they have a fresh perspective. That's right, yeah, that's true. And that's what you bring to our company too. So it's. It's great to have you involved with. Heath, what would you say so far has been your biggest challenge? Has it been dealing with a, a single customer, a product? Um... I, I would say it's probably PMC8, just trying to learn everything in and out of it. That's, I mean, that's why we have these groups to help inform people and help get it out there. We right. have a lot of questions pertaining to, to the PMC8 system and just, just learning that has taken me a little while. That's probably my number one. So, so we did a, um, here I'll bring the rest of the team on here. We've, we've been doing um, uh, a, um, a training program that we're call, we call Mentor here at Explore Scientific. And uh, a lot of that has been really concentrated on the PMC-8 system to begin with. And uh, uh, so we had, um, we had tests <laughs> they actually went through about, was it two weeks of training? Is that right, Jerry? Or was it just a no, week? No, we've been through about, well, since the beginning, it's been six six or seven weeks now that we've gone through. Okay. All right. Yeah. But we did just have a test, okay, that uh, yeah. customer service had to take. And uh, um, uh, so Heath and Tyler, how did you guys fare on this test? Passed. You passed? <laughs> By like, like flying? Colors, like by the skin of your teeth. I pass with flying colors all the time, Scott. <laughs> they got. A, I heard they got a hard-ass teacher that's a pain in the he butt. He is, but I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I did okay. I had. I got an 88, so that was. That was oh, good. that's a, that's great. Good. Yeah. So you had to make a score of 70 to pass this. Um. Let's see. Do we have any comments here that pertain to any of this? Um, can't build scopes now. This is from Brett Blake. He's busy filling out college app. Oh, can't build scopes now. He's busy filling out college applications. Makes me feel old. Uh, Jeff Wise uh, liked the uh, shopping center outreach. Uh, that uh, Marcello Souza showed us. So uh, that was another really cool highlight of the Global Star Party 12. Um, a Brazilian uh, professor of astronomy and, and physics down there uh, does a ton of educational outreach. And he, may, he turned an outside mall into a uh, movie theater for science and astronomy. And so he had telescopes set up, he had uh, big LCD, powerful LCD projector aim at the wall of this, uh, of this mall. And I think Marcello was um, actually broadcasting into their cars uh, with, uh, with an audio system that was maybe tuned to FM or something like that. So that was really, really cool. And there was this, there was this arbor, this archway that you had to drive through and they had signage up there and it was very retro. It looked like something you would see from a 1950s uh, movie drive-in. So it was, it was cool. It was very cool. And I thought, I think that uh, Marcello deserves some sort of uh, recognition award for this. So anyways, 
uh, but really loved it. And um, uh, let's see what else we have here as far as comments. Time flies and you're having fun. Yes, it is. What up, Heath? Good, good talk the other week. Uh, that's from Astro Beard, Richard Grace. So you've been working with him. Astronomy Notebook. Uh, the young are able to get into astrophotography these days by using their cell phones at the eyepiece, which is far less ex expensive entry point into the hobby. That's true, but everybody's using a cell phone on their on their uh, uh, telescopes. You know, whether they're beginners or advanced. Um, I I do too so um, but we are seeing we are seeing young people get into the hobby with a you know serious go-to mount a, a, a nice uh, uh, science camera um, you know and uh, you know usually they're working with like a refractor um, is what I see them typically working with so it's kind of this new new generation of astrophotographers um, Let's see. Chuck Lewis says no door prizes for correct answers. Yes, we have door prizes. We have we have uh, enlisted some prize partners, and so they are giving out. One of the companies is giving out a cu custom space shirts and stuff. So, um, so if you have won one of the prizes, you'll be getting that. Another one of the prize partners is Gary uh, 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 Palmer, who who is giving uh, uh, time, you know, his time for that, because he runs these tutorial programs. So, of course, Explore Scientific is giving out prizes as well. Um, I thought that uh, the Mark Slade Remote Observatory may give some an introductory intro you wanna, lesson. Yeah, sure, sure. So there On you, the MSRO Observatory. There you go. So there's another. That would be fun. Uh, that would be an experience. So we'll have to uh, announce that next time. Uh, Dusty Askins said, I wake up to the broadcast you were watching has ended again this morning. Makes for a good night's sleep. <laughs> Hopefully the global star party isn't putting you to sleep. So, but uh, <clears throat> eventually it will, you know, because you'll just be exhausted. Um, Ken says he still has two two hours and forty five minutes left uh, to finish watching last night's star party. You know that's great that we have people watch all of it. That's awesome. Yeah, it is great. Uh, that's uh, there's a lot there's a lot of content. You know, yeah. There's a lot of content there. There is. There is. Uh... <laughs> Dave Ng says, cell phone? I'm not allowed a phone in my cell. Under house arrest, no, no doubt. So, um, And Michael Whitaker, had to get my new DSLR today. Couldn't, couldn't lose eight millimeters with the other one uh, so that I could use my flattener. Easier to add spacers than take away. Love this hobby. Okay. <laughs> yes, there's the spacer issues or can be a something to pull your hair out. Um, and uh, Wolfgang says, I watched the end of the star party after I woke up. So, so there you go. So what do you what are you seeing out there, uh, Tyler? Any any uh, what's going on with the community? And I think you and I have talked about it uh, a little bit. Uh, you say it's uh, fairly quiet. Um, uh, I know that you've also been uh, involved in, I saw you today advising people on getting a uh, G11 with PMC8. You were showing mm -hmm. your rig that you're building. How, how's your rig coming along and, and how did that, how, how is that helping you work with customers? Uh, it's slow, uh, building the rig it is, um, but it gives me more hands-on with the PMC-8 and the G11 that, that I own. Because um, I, I get to, I mean, working here, I get to take anything that I want home uh, to try out and understand how these things work. Um, but I figured if I'd reach out of the box and get the G11, I can try newer things out for customers that have questions that some other people may not be able to purchase. 
as far as that. Um, but it's helped me just understand how the process works within the PMC-8 with mm -hmm. the different mounts set up, um, different programs uh, like Stellarium, because I've seen a lot of issues with in the groups, IO people having a hard time mm -hmm. getting the ASCOM to communicate with it. But I think me and Jerry and uh, Mr. David Campbell have figured out the, the scenario and we posted it today um to help people out i just hope they, they read it and they understand it um, right so they can achieve what they need to achieve right right so what have you found to be the biggest challenge though in, in getting your, your own particular rig ready cable management cable management that's where i'm at <laughs> That's where I'm at right now. Trying, trying to figure out where everything's going to go so I don't have snags or a whole bunch of cords everywhere. And it's it's a challenge. I don't know how Jerry does it. Right. Uh, I don't. I, I don't. Pop a glue gun and just glue those cables where I want them. I know. If, the mount's too pretty. Bungee cords? If I showed you, if I showed you the MSRO cables, you would say that's a mess. <laughs> As long as uh, it's we, we change we change instruments you know who has a, a really beautiful rig okay and has done beautiful cable management is uh steve seedentop okay he watches mm -hmm. the show sometimes uh, but if you look at his, his at his rig i mean it looks like you've looked under the hood of a race car you know there's there's the the hub where all the usb connectors are and he's got them like lined up uh i'm not going to say they're color coded but I mean, it looks cool. It does, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him to uh, maybe. Actually, a good idea would be to ask him to come on the show and show his rig and the way he's done cable cable management, because I think that's a little topic right there. Certainly, I'm. Uh, you know, I, it's for a selfish reason. You know, I'm also very very interested in that. So. No, I got to get my little nook ordered, um, and I'm gonna have to get with Jerry and figure out the other things and go from there. So yeah. I can actually participate in the star party instead of vicariously watching through everybody else's stuff. I'm hoping maybe by next week, I have a system that we can actually let people log into and uh, um, start shooting. So um, let's see, some comments coming through here. Wade Prunty says he's OCD about cable management. Uh, Brett Blake, Jerry, if you're not there to kick the tripod and trip over the wires, you're missing half the fun. <laughs> I've got uh, I've got a lot of experience with that. I set my system up over 200 times back, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. So I've got that experience. I don't need to have it anymore. Oh man. Yeah. Well, let's see. Jim Norwood says, I have only one cable at, the, at my stage of development, and I still had to jerk the power plug on the IXOs 100 to keep from getting tangled up. <laughs> Man, that's tough. Um, Jeff Wise says, Mike Lemus has created several nice 3D prints of cable management tools on Thingsverse. Thingsverse skies... Uh, it's guys. Oh, Thingiverse. Oh. Is it Thingiverse or Thingsverse? What's that? Is it Thingiverse or Thingsverse? Thingsverse. Thingver. Okay. Thingver. Things, thingverse. Is it Thingverse? Mm hmm. Sky Slalom 1. Okay. Michael Whitaker. Since I took up astrophotography, I haven't needed to go to the hairdressers, just the liquor store. <laughs> There's always group therapy too, you know, so we can, you know, maybe I can get a therapist on the show. Uh, Wolfgang says he has only three cables, easy to manage. That's good. Dave Ing says I have a single cable bundle from my power station to the mount. I think he's on to the right track there. Uh, Richard Grace, I, I have only two cables to my mount from the house. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. All right, guys. So we have a trick. We have a trick at the observatory. We use a uh, uh, our Ethernet and power runs over the, the power cable. We have a power line Ethernet adapter that we use to go to the observatory. So we have hardwired Ethernet over power line 
So we have one cable running to the observatory from the uh, uh, from our router inside Myron's house. Oh, okay. And you could actually do communications over one wire if you wanted to do it that way for for network connections. You know, I cable management is also something not only something amateurs deal with, but but professionals do too. Uh, when I went to Cerro Tololo for the eclipse uh, last year, uh, we ran you know we ran lots of cables because we're doing a. We're doing basically a television broadcast through our telescopes, and uh, we had optical fiber running up to the uh, scopes themselves to transfer the image data. And uh, uh, all over the all over Cerro Tololo are like these grids and these channels that go down into the ground, and all the cables go down. So you have to lift a metal grate up. Okay, so it takes like two guys lift up the metal grate. Boom. Uh, run some of the cable, you know, put that down, put the, lift the next one up, put that one down. So, you, you know, you're, you know, and, and we're trying to do this quickly because, you know, every hour is precious before you get to an eclipse. And uh, you want as much just kind of quiet, settled in time where everything's running and you know that everything's tweaked and everybody can be settled, you know, ready for the actual event to happen. But, um, uh, I was uh, interested to know that they had those metal grates and the channels because they have like some sort of fox that lives out there that eats the cables, any cable. So, you know, and I've heard of mice eating, you know, uh, amateur astronomers cables and stuff like that or finding uh, Sheldon Faworski is a friend of mine that, that has two or three observatories at his home. And uh, he smelled something really foul and found a mouse that had climbed inside this paramount, okay, and started chewing away at the cables and did himself in. So, um, you know, these are things to, to consider. Uh, and uh, Tyler, you were showing me like some sort of cable shield or something like that, that you could wrap the cables in. Yeah. Is this to hold the cables together or is this to protect it from squirrels? Both. <laughs> Okay. Most uh, um, computer geeks or any any kind of desk jockey you know, to keep the cable management. It's it's just a cable shielding, just a piece of plastic that's cut in half. You can throw over it, and it's just one big cable, so you can just strap it onto your mount to make it more less messy. Right. So, one thing that I found, I used to do that when I first started, also, but I found it a pain in the butt when you had to change something out with the cables. Yeah. That's, that's always the pain in the butt about it. Uh, if you if you're into an active development cycle where you're making changes or you're trying different things out, I'm sure I'm sure Gary Palmer doesn't use cable management. Actually, he does. When he's doing all of his changes and stuff, I mean. Well, he uses the eagle, so all he literally does is just drop oh, the telescope so down, and he's done. Yeah, he, he doesn't yeah. mess with anything. He's got a fixed set of cables that he's got yeah. every different type of thing to connect up all in one big bundle. Yep. Michael Whitaker wants to know how long can I run a serial cable from the mount without affecting the performance? And Jeff says not far. <laughs> um, no, serial. Actually, serial communications will go quite far. Even at 115K baud. Uh, I used to run instruments in the containment at the nuclear station. Yeah. Uh, serial communications over our internal communication lines. It's a twisted pair out into the instrument shop, which is like at least a hundred yards. We oh. had instruments that we would hook up serial connection to and be able to have a handheld controller to read the ad data out of the containment uh, that way. And so actually serial communications, RS-232 will go quite far. Hmm. I see. And what kind of connectors were on the uh, on serial? It was the just ver the venerable DB9. DB9s. Or even DB15. We used to use DB15 cables also, but DB9 serial. Right. Mm-hmm. Wade says, remember that cables add weight and drag to your deck and RA axis. Just have that in mind in the back of your mind when you are strapping them together. So I think that that's I think that's the reason why I want to put my NUC and all of my cable mm -hmm. connecting everything up 
where the scope is. You know, Up on the mount. Yes, that's, that's what right. I want to do too. There's no drag at anything. But see, what are you going to do with the telescope drive master? You going to put it on a leg, or you going to put it up there as well? Hmm. I'm going to put it on a leg because uh, we're just controlling the RA axis. Correct. Move, but know. does does anything need to go to the nook as far as that aspect? No. Any wires? Okay. So I could stand alone. Okay. I guess you could read out the performance on the PC. Is that is that right, Jerry? What? Say that again. You got one serial cable that goes between the NUC and the PMC8. That's all. Oh, that's true. I guess if you can get the information from there. And that cable can be three foot long. Right. And so, but that's a fixed position. It's not going to. You've got the nut, the NUC near the center of, of rotation. It's not going to move very much, you know, while it's while it's tracking. Mm -hmm. Even when you point anywhere in the sky, that position right in the middle, on top of the mount, doesn't move very much. So that would be the best position for for the equipment. You see, most people mount their their equipment either right on top of the scope or yeah, or next to the mount, real close to the center of rotation, wherever the axes move around. Right. So I'm thinking about on the top of my G11. So you got the scope kind of going like, you know, here it comes down on, on the uh, D plate. Okay. And the D plates into the saddle, but on the saddle, I want kind of like some wings, like some shelf space where I can put my, maybe my knuck there mounted either upside down or up on top and then run my cables around. But, uh, but I'd like to have the cable shortened so I don't have like extra cable, you know, that I got to wind up or. Yeah, you, you got to coil it up and tie wrap it. I don't want to do that. I want to have you optimized, you know, uh, chop the cables and make my own connectors or whatever. So. You going to use risers? Mm, I don't know. I, I like the scope kind of down low on the saddle, you know, it's uh, easier. Well, the the G11 compared to the ED102, I mean, it's 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 uh, I've got more a, a lot more mouth than telescope, you know, so that's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> but um, but generally, if I had a bigger scope, I wouldn't want to use risers, you know, because uh, you know now I have to use extra counterweight. Now there's there's just more uh, room for flexure and. Uh, if I'm using more counterweight, it just makes the whole thing, uh, you know, especially if it's a portable system, I got to carry mm -hmm. more weight, you know, and I'd rather not do that. So, if, But if you get the TDM, that kind of eliminates the need or the purpose of a guide scope. So you're, technically you're True. taking away the weight. And that's that's the, uh, I am looking to eliminate the 80 off of there, uh, potentially. Uh, the other reason why I might keep the 80 is I just want a wider field shot. You know, be able to switch the camera arrangement. You know, let me or let me show you all a picture that I've got. I I mounted a spectrometer on top of my system. This is about eight or eight years ago when I developed this. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, Richard Gray says he's running a 65 foot USB 3.0 active repeater cable plus another 10 foot of USB. That's long. I'll zoom up on this thing. Curious to know if he's running that repeater, if it's causing any or anything wrong with his camera. Mm -hmm. The repeater type. Now, Jerry, was that a PowerPoint presentation, or were you like actually plugged into your brain and seeing? Yeah, this is the. Yeah, I was scrolling through my brain, <laughs> looking for this picture, but I thought I had another version of this picture in the presentation. We no, we're... I can show you this presentation, but this is a fiber fed spectrometer that I created uh, using this commercial off the shelf, oh, wow. cheap, cheap uh, spectrometer. That was a chemical analysis system. And I, I designed it. I used this Orion flip mirror to put a cold mirror in here. Okay. And basically the cold mirror uh, sends the infrared signal through to the camera and the visible up through the, the fiber into the spectrometer. Look at you, man. And uh, this is how I mounted it on top of the 127. I see. Um, Click. How did it work? 
It worked great. Yeah. Uh, I can let me let me give you an example of what I did with it here. Let me see here. So this is how this is what the inside of it looks like. All right, the fiber comes in and it's got this focusing mirror and then it's got this grating that spread the light out across the linear CCD. It's a a linear CCD is like a two pixel by 2000 pixel linear array. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, what did it but uh, build that? so this is what I created. I drilled a hole through the flip mirror because yeah. I wanted the light to come through. The infrared comes through the cold mirror and reflects the visible up in a cold mirror. All a cold mirror is is a uh, uh, special optic that or glass that, that has this type of uh, response here. Mm -hmm. uh, the wavelength. Uh, but there's some calculations to do with the fiber and the and the focal length you have to set up and everything. And this is what the image looked like on the. Uh, and the uh, camera when you're tracking, when you're track uh, locked onto that, the image of the star. Okay. And uh, and this is what the spectra looked like. Uh, I wrote this program to display the spectra, and it also um, I uh, once you acquire the data, and I used an LCD panel to calibrate it with the uh, because an LCD puts out these peaks at specific wavelengths. Yeah. So you can calibrate the, the wavelength on the spectrometer and the end, and then you have a response curve for the instrument that you have to account for. And then the end result is this. Um, let me see if I got it here, this right here. So this is Aldebaran. The blue is the uh, reference spectra from the catalog. And I used RSpec, which is Tom, uh, Tom Fields program that he wrote to analyze spec. Uh, spectral images but uh, the blue is the reference spectra and the red is what I measured and you can see it matches pretty well mm -hmm. these absorption lines right and uh, I was pretty happy with it it was fairly high resolution really close this look at that box this box only cost 200 bucks wow and it's like a $1,500 piece of equipment right um so that was kind of a cool project i did that back in 2010 i think it was mm -hmm. but i wanted to show you what i had mounted on top of this is kind of the way i mounted stuff on the scope i see so you made like a little um just a little riser platform to lay the box on it looks like right a dovetail and then i had this adm plate that i screwed the box onto mm-hmm and then you can see the fiber comes up and around over. Mm -hmm. You got a red dot over there, electric focuser. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Jerry, in your years of doing this, which, which electronic focuser do you mainly prefer? I started out early on with the moonlight focuser, and I've always, since then, I just prefer that. Um, I've known Ron Newman for quite a long time and he's a great guy. I've, I probably bought between MSRO and my own personal focusers. I've probably bought six focusers from him over the years. Right. Uh, actually I, I was the first one to, to put a moonlight on the 127 carbon fiber. And also on the 152, 165 carbon fiber, I had to send my focuser off to get him to make an adapter plate for it. Uh, so everybody that has those tubes now can buy a moonlight focuser and adapt it to that. Uh, Wade Prunty is making a comment to you, Tyler. He says, if you're using the ASIF row, uh, you have to stick with the ZWO EAF. I don't have to worry about it anymore, Wade. I got, I, I passed it along that someone could use it. <laughs> Do you pass along or is it, uh, oh, so somebody else could use it, right? Somebody else can use it now. Um, I need to. Addition, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very not... well used. 
I mean, they could be used, but I need to I want to try out different equipment. I don't want to be right with one, stuck with one brand. I have heard so many great things about the ASI. Prepared. It's wonderful. It's great, but I just I want to expand the horizons now. It was limited for you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's not that it didn't work, right? Worked flawlessly. Works flawless. worked, worked every time. Didn't have any issues other than trying to hook it up with a PMCA, but I got that figured out. Yep. Um, but other than that, it worked every time I turned it on. Oh, great. Okay. You can't complain about that. So, well, uh, gentlemen, I, um, uh, tomorrow we are going to have uh, Maruska Straw join us. Uh, she is the executive director of World Space Week. Now, I don't know how many of you, you know, celebrate World Space Week or, you know, but uh, it should be like, a, uh, you know, a Christmas for astronomers, you know, because it is the, it is the world's largest uh, space celebration uh, in the world. And um, so I just a little bit of history about it. Um, uh, uh, it's an ad, the World Space Week was uh, announced by the United Nations General Assembly in 1999. Uh, and it's celebrated uh, between October 4th and 10th. And the choice of dates, it's not based off of weekend to weekend or something. The choice of dates was the recognition of two important dates in space history. The first was the launch of the first human-made Earth satellite, which is Sputnik 1, on October 4th, 1957. And then the signing of the Outer Space Treaty on October 10th, 1967. Uh, aside from being the world, uh, the largest annual space event in the world, um, uh, it's celebrated uh, uh, just last year, uh, 8,000 events in 96 countries around the world. These include schools, uh, exhibitions, government events, special activities at planetariums around the world. Um, and uh, this year, uh, Explore Alliance is participating. We have signed uh, up as one of the official events of World Space Week uh, with the Global Star Party next Tuesday, which will be our 13th Global Star Party. Um, uh, so the, um, the theme um, for this year is going to be uh, Satellites Improve Life. So that might be raise some eyebrows for some people about uh, how many satellites we have in the sky. And um, we talked a little bit at the Global Star Party last night about um, uh, the, uh, you know, the Starlink satellites and multiple satellites being up in the sky that would improve uh, global communications with, uh, with Internet. But... Um, uh, Jerry, what, what is, you, you had some, you weighed in with some thoughts yesterday about, uh, well, what my thinking is, is, you know, we're a dynamic thinking community. We can overcome, we're, we're used to overcoming problems. And one of the things people kind of take a static look at these satellites that is going to ruin astronomy when you do imaging. But we always overcome these obstacles. And right now, even amateurs today, when we process our images, we have satellites show up all the time in our images and we just have to manage it. And our processing tools, uh, the way we, we do the math on the images, it, it removes those defects. Hmm. So it's not a big issue for amateurs, I don't think. Professionals may have special needs that it, that it may cause problems, but again, they throw money at the problem. It'll, they'll, we'll solve it. You know, it's going to be solved. It's not going to be an issue in my mind. I mean, people may disagree, but I'm sure, but Elon Musk, he's doing it. I think he's doing a good job doing outreach to the astronomy community and trying to accommodate the needs of the astronomy community to mitigate the problem as much as he can. Elon Musk has got to be also interested in amateur astronomy himself, you know, so uh, now he is taking the next big leap out there because he's putting people in space uh, and intends to uh, uh, to do uh, these trips himself. So, uh, uh, but um, you know, there's uh, you know, it, I, it's a little bit different uh, uh, flying in space versus exploring space with the telescope. 
And even in the uh, space shuttle, uh, they carried, uh, when I was working at Meet Instruments, I learned from some of the astronauts there that they had, uh, not publicly announced, but they had carried a Mead 8-inch schmidt cassegrain you know, on every space shuttle flight that ever flew. So, and they would use the telescope and just aim it at the window, it's zero gravity, and uh, peer out uh, across space, you know. So, can you imagine? Uh, you know, I mean, zero light pollution uh, and, uh, you know, great uh, you know, and perfect seeing all the time. So, you know. Well, you do have reflections. I guess you had to be in a dark room or dark in the cabin before you could look out the window. It's in, a, in, a, in an area and do that. But uh, uh, they were, you know, talking about how really good it was. So um, I wonder if some of the, uh, you know, if they have windows on on the spacecraft that are actually optically good you know so that was a curiosity i had but i couldn't couldn't find out a lot more about it because they didn't really want to talk about it i thought there was a uh, i think on the space station there's a uh, there's an installation a telescope installation on the station itself that they opened up i remember watching a video when they were installing this telescope system they removed this hatch and it exposed this window that they installed the telescope in. I, I'd have to find it and see what it, what it is exactly. This was like two or three years ago. I remember yeah. watching a video about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, great. Mike Wiesner says, I got to meet an astronaut who was a Meet ETX fan. That's awesome. Andrew Corkill says, I think Jerry is right. The satellites will not be a big issue, but then I'm a visual astronomer. So I love more starry things to look at. <laughs> it's very cool seeing a satellite drift across your view when you're looking through an eyepiece. I, I saw a lot, quite a few of those when I did my visual stuff. Uh huh. Neat to watch. Right. Yeah. All right, Andrew. Well, your next telescope will be a 20-inch uh, trust tube Dobsonian from Explore Scientific. <laughs> it's an awesome telescope. We we just got in some. And they sold like that. They're gone. They are gone. So we have to get more in. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm surprised. They're pretty expensive. They're pretty expensive items, aren't they? It's not. They're not cheap. Oh, they're not. They're not expensive at all. <laughs> they're no. affordable. They're affordable, but they're, they're good values. I would yes. say they're excellent values. Excellent value for their money. But you know, if you're trying to decide where your next meal is coming from, you probably don't want to go off and blow all your money on a 20-inch uh, top Sunian telescope by anybody. So, um, But anyhow, I, um, I think that's a, a wrap for today. Do you guys have anything more to add? Anything? Are there any final questions from anybody on the audience? Rick? Uh, Jeff Y says the QHY 52426C camera and the QHY 53 or triple I maybe 178M are superb cameras and you would not be able to use them with the ASI Air. Okay. Nope. nope. The okay. two, the double I and the triple I are basically USB 2 and USB 3 cameras. That's what the III means. Richard Gray says, I found Starlinks to be less of a problem than the, than the bigger, brighter sets, but everyone is just complaining about Starlink. Um, I lose a couple of subs uh, here and there, but no big deal. Life is good. Keep looking up and looking at the bright side. That's right. That's right, you know. Um, Jeff Y says, Tom Pickett said last night that he has four or five streaks in every sub. Hmm. It must be in a bad area. I don't know. He's in Texas. There's a lot of, if you're near a big city, airplanes, <laughs> airplanes cause streaks too. Meteors. Meteors. Yeah. Now, I think he was in talking about satellites, but not sure. What's your experience, Jerry? You guys do a ton of imaging. Yeah, we get quite a few uh, airplanes. We always, on our all sky camera, we see airplanes flying across the, you know, and then if we happen to be pointed 
we'll see an airplane fly across, but not very often. Typically, we'll get uh, I don't know out of a out of a couple hours of imaging, we might get three or four images with uh, satellites on them. Actually, more than that, probably about I would say three to five percent maybe would have satellites on them. Yeah, it's not that many. Andrew says, I have some questions about the PMC-8 and the iPad app, but I'll ask them in the forum. But you can ask them here. Might as well ask them here. You got everybody's attention. All right, here he goes. All right, this is what we're here for, Andrew. I have tracking set to lunar tracking speed through the iPad app. And when I slew the telescope around the moon, tracking stops. And I have to start it again after I finish slewing. Is this normal? No, you're using Explore Stars. I assume yes. Well, he's got to be he's got to be entering a value into the tracking rate. It's not just a pull down selection. So he had to enter a value into the tracking rate to get the lunar rate according to the table that we went over before. Yep. Uh, the uh, so once that so it should be no different if you slew to the object, slew to the moon. It should be tracking automatically. Tracking is always on on Explore Stars. If it's not. If it turns off for some reason, um, the only time I've ever seen it turn off is if you enter an altitude and azimuth coordinate on the system, then it will stop tracking. But otherwise, it should continue to track. So I'm not sure why it would be doing that uh, if he's slewing to the moon. The Heath, tracking rate doesn't impact that. Yes. Let's have Heath do this. So uh, what I'm going to have you do is contact Andrew. Andrew Corkill, and um, he says he has tracking set to lunar tracking speed through the iPad app, and when I slew the telescope around the moon, tracking stops. And I have to start it again after I finish slewing. Is this normal? That's the other thing that there's no switch to turn tracking on and off on the Explore Stars app, so I don't know what he means by turning it on again. Does he mean by hitting the point track button and put it track between point. track mode and point mode? Not, not sure. Not sure yet. We'll find out. And what mounts are you using on the PMC-8? He has a uh, he has an XS2. And Andrew says, yeah, I'm using Explore Stars. Yes, I understand. I, yes, I entered the new value. Uh, when I do small slews around the moon, it stops tracking. I'll do some more testing. And we'll do some testing here, too. Uh, Mike Wiesner, with the tens of thousands of low Earth orbit satellites that have been approved from a dark site at certain times of the night, you will see more satellites than stars. The other thing to keep in mind with these low Earth orbit satellites is you typically only see them near, you know, after sunset and before sunrise because that's when the angle of the sun is such that it will reflect off the satellite into the uh, onto the ground. So if you're at least two hours past or before sunrise, sunset, then the sh satellites shouldn't really be a problem unless they're very high altitude. Not low Earth orbit satellites anyway, shouldn't be an issue. Mm -hmm. Michael Whitaker says, Explore size only moves to tracking if you use the left, right, up, down buttons. Right, that's track mode. That's mm -hmm. a manual mode. Dustin Gibson says, the crew. How you doing, Dustin? Uh, Andrew says, I'm using the big slew buttons doohickey, not the left, right, up, down. Oh, He's I using the joystick. Using the joystick, yeah. I do like the term doohickey better, though. That's very Texas of you, Andrew. 
And I can say that because I'm from Texas. <laughs> That's right. Oh, uh, anyhow. Hey, Dustin, congrats on, on the 61. Yep. What episode number is this? We are at, I think we're at episode 78. 78. Yep. We're getting close to 100. Big door prize coming at 100. What's Big 100? Yeah. That's right. The 100, 100 millimeter, 100. And, uh, we don't have 100 millimeter, do we? No. 100 millimeter eyepiece? We got, one, we got a 100 millimeter eyepiece, a 102. Uh, Limited edition of one. <laughs> true. Sell it for $10,000. Well, folks, I think that we're kind of winding down our show. Um, we've been on uh, on for a little over an hour, I think, here. So, um, is that right? Not quite an hour. Right at an hour. So, anyways, you're going to really enjoy Maruska tomorrow. Um, uh, she's... Uh, you know, going to let us know all about uh, World Space Week, how you can get involved, um, you know, and uh, so, you know, you might want to think of loved ones that don't have telescopes that might need one, you know, so it would be a great uh, week to do a gift of a telescope, you know, to pass on a telescope to someone getting started uh, or to give some uh, uh, mentoring to someone that uh, is still kind of struggling through it, you know, so we try to do that here every day. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to go uh, fall unconscious, I think, and in a few minutes. And so <laughs> thanks for watching. Uh, and as Jack Horkheimer, my friend Jack Horkheimer always said, uh, you know, keep looking up and um, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care.